Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Photodocus Mystery. This will be part 275R. We're going to have a review of our Sunday's lesson where we left off, <coughs> the title of which is The Call of the Wise, Part 2R. In a brief recapitulation, Scripture teaches that the wise are the saints who have been given authority to feed God's sheep at the beginning of sorrows. Their authority comes directly from the Father, from an eternal <coughs> predisposition, a sovereign move of the Father upon a specific group of individuals. Now, we find that the Father uh, supplies all that's needed in the way of knowledge of events, knowledge of purpose, knowledge of direction for the beginning of sorrows, yes. In the gathering, there are going to be many groups that you, you've given us the understanding of Mr. Johnson. Mm -hmm. And is it fair to expect us to be in one group? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> now we find that the Father has <clears throat> purposed this revelation knowledge and given it in such a way that it becomes available at a specific time to those who are disposed to comprehend it. The comprehension aspect is called wisdom. Not worldly wisdom, but godly wisdom. Now Paul speaks about this specific godly wisdom, which we will recapitulate. 1 Corinthians 2nd chapter Verse 6 to 7. Howbeit, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. So, right off the bat, this wisdom is not for everybody. This wisdom is to be shared among those that have the capacity to comprehend it. The word perfect there, of course, means mature. So he's talking about, he's separating worldly wisdom which of course would be likened unto the wisdom of Solomon, to this spiritual godly wisdom, which he says, among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that are come to naught. <clears throat> but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. The hidden wisdom is designed <clears throat> for the wise to comprehend the hidden revelation, which is only given to the mature who have been authorized to see it, to understand it from eternity. That's why we have such a hard time finding others that can basically comprehend what's being said. Because the Father has not delegated the wisdom to be given beyond those that he authorized to give it to. Paul is talking about this. He continues on. <coughs> Drop down to verse <coughs> 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know. We might know. 
discern, perceive, comprehend the things that are freely given to us of God. The wisdom is given through the Holy Spirit who inhabits the new creation and enlightens the new creation about the knowledge that has been hidden from all others from the beginning. Turn to Daniel, 12th chapter, verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. Why will they understand? Because the Father has ordained understanding through the revelation that they're going to receive. They're going to know. They're going to understand things that other people aren't. Not because they're anything but because they've been chosen by the Father to receive it mm. and to delegate it to those that have been prepared to receive it. Matthew 24. This is what's happening. Mm -hmm. So if a person has the word why to apply to them, automatically they have the authority to distribute. Yes. Okay. Yes. Verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath, hath, hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? The Father has delegated authority for them to be rulers over his household to feed them. <clears throat> this is tying these scriptures together. 1 Corinthians, the 2nd chapter, Daniel, the 12th chapter, Matthew 24. <clears throat> that servant is going to come into his own at the time of the beginning of sorrows. Because that will be the time in which the sheep need to be given meat. That's the due season he's referring to. <clears throat> At that time everything culminates to one, one focal point. The collapse of this current order, the opening of the revelation, and the distrib distributing it to those that have been ordained to receive it. So the moment, at the moment that the student arrives to be fed, he is wise. No, he's not wise. The teacher is wise. Agreed. But is the student wise for having received it in the first place? We understood that there's a certain amount of wisdom involved in following the Holy Spirit to receive the... That's true, but we're talking about the teacher. Okay. Because the student hasn't gotten any understanding yet. Right. It's all the responsibility of the teacher to be prepared to give it to him at that time. At what point does the student become wise? When he receives the revelation and he applies it. I've just said that. But he's not going to apply it until he receives the volume of the revelation, which now is being given to the teacher. Okay. When he comes to the teacher, he's he's not wise. He's wise in the sense that he's been obedient to right. be open, right. but you right. can't compare that to the wisdom that he's going to be receiving, which takes him to a level beyond anything he could comprehend at the point that he starts. Is he wise at the gathering? Sure. Okay. At the gathering, he's received everything. Gotcha. He's prepared okay. now. Right. He he would be considered a wise person. Right. But before that, no. Okay. He's just a student. The wise one is the teacher. Yes. That was my question. Yes. 
Yeah. This all refers to the teacher. The student hasn't been given the authority. Right. He hasn't been given the understanding. Mm -hmm. All he knows is that when the X, Y axis crosses, he needs to be open because he's going to be directed gotcha. to receive revelations been hidden from the beginning. So, the so the whole thing about him being open to receive and to be directed to the gathering, Mr. John, that's not considered wisdom? The gathering is on the part of the wise. Mm. The student won't know how to go to the gathering. He doesn't know anything. Mm. The wise is preparing him through the revelation knowledge that he's going to receive. Over a protracted period of time from the start that he receives it to the time that he gets to the gathering, he is totally under the teacher. And unwise. Yes. Only at the point of the gathering does he become wise. He comes wise. into his own, yeah. And that point, that sets the second stage where the wise are rewarded mm -hmm. by getting their inheritance. And now the student is prepared to receive. He's going to be in the community, under the ascended teacher, receiving what he needs for the future. Because all, all of this now has to do with the teacher. So then, that also implies that the student is not authorized to dispute anything until when? Until he receives the fullness of what he's to be given. The gathering. That's like saying, when the apostles ready to go before the time that Jesus released them. Of course not. No, yeah. they weren't ready. Same is going to be with you. The people that come under your teaching <coughs> are going to stay under your teaching until they've received all the whole counsel of God. Otherwise, they won't be ready. So let's imagine that the group is the group and the lesson has concluded for the day and then the group members discuss amongst themselves what they've just now learned. Is that... Sure. Probably. Okay. Sure. That's yeah. that's, that's, that's wisdom, mandated. Right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Sure. They have to put in operation what they're getting, sure. what they're given. So that's the application of what he's described. Yes, that's but that's not the fullness. That's agree, the, agree. But it is the application of what they're learning. Most definitely. Yeah. You can't you can't achieve it unless you do that. Sure. So what we want to do now is we want to get focused on the teacher. Why? Because the teacher has to know his responsibilities, no. otherwise he's not going to be able to carry out his function. <clears throat> Which takes us to the next principle. <clears throat> Scripture teaches, the kingdom of the heavens will only accept those who are dependent on continuous revelation knowledge. Purity of life is not enough. Now we're going to look at Matthew 25 verses 1 to 12. And there's one overall message <coughs> that we will look at as we read this parable that causes the foolish to be foolish and the wise to be wise. I'm going to give you what that principle is that separates the two. And the principle is that revelation knowledge is continuous. Revelation knowledge is continuous. The wise know this, the foolish do not. That's why they make the decision they make. <laughs> Matthew 25 Starting in verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. We said last week what the lamps were. The lamps are symbolic of the word of God. The oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit that illuminates the Word of God. You can see the difference in this. The scribes and the Pharisees knew the Word of God. They could recite the book of Isaiah, all 66 books from memory. But they didn't understand the Word. They understood it from an intellectual perspective, not from a godly perspective. They didn't have the oil. 
Just like organized religion makes the same mistake. They don't have the understanding. They have an intellectual <clears throat> perspective of it. Nothing more. They don't think they need anything more. They can quote scripture. Exactly. <laughs> now, they that were foolish, verse 3, took their lamps, took no oil with them, but the wise took all in their vessels with their lamps. What is this symbolizing? Christians believe that what they learned a year ago, 10 years ago, 50 years ago, is a lump sum total of what they need to know today. They do not comprehend that the word of God, revelation knowledge, is progressive. Therefore, they limit the comprehension of what they have. The wise understand that revelation knowledge is progressive. God will add to your understanding of revelation periodically. That's what makes a person wise. You talk to Christians today, they're not open to revelation knowledge. They think that you're teaching cultic teaching. Why? Because it hadn't been taught to them before, therefore they know all they need to know about it. Therefore, they have a, a, a leg up on everything they need to know. The book is closed and sealed. They have the sum, lump sum total of all that's needful. That's a fatal mistake. Because it opens the person up to not being prepared for what an understanding of the, of the progression of revelation knowledge would give them. And this is what we see. The Lord gives us an understanding. They all start off unified. Everybody believed the same thing. They were reading the same sheet of music. No discrepancies. They're one. That's why the difference doesn't come into being until the end. We'll read on. Verse 5, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. So this indicates a protracted period of time takes place. <clears throat> Verse 6, And at midnight, the darkest hour, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him midnight when you need the light the most verse 7 then all these virgins arose and trimmed their lamps in other words everybody realized you needed to apply knowledge wisdom to understand the circumstances that were taking place. The circumstances that are taking place are symb symbolized by the darkness of the midnight hour. <laughs> the lamps symbolize the light of understanding that will illuminate the darkness of the midnight hour. So you could perceive in objectivity what's taking place and be able to maneuver your way to where you need to go. So they all trim their lamps. They like their lamps, in other words. Verse 8, And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Now in the original Greek, it's not they're not saying their lamps are gone out. It's saying their lamps are going out. What does that mean? It means that they're applying the revelation knowledge of what they have and it's not giving them enough illumination to discern what they're dealing with. They are faltering as they get closer and closer to where the bridegroom is waiting. It's harder and harder for them to get to that point because their lamps are not giving them enough light to see where to go. What does this mean? It means that the individuals have revelation knowledge that was adequate for them when they started. Mm -hmm. It ain't adequate enough for them now. Right. They need the continuous revelation knowledge to eliminate their understanding. That's this the, is the principle of this parable. That's the equivalent of failing to read the last three principles of a Bible study lesson. 
and thinking you have the entirety of the, the lesson. It's now. yeah, it's <coughs> a failure on the part of the individual's sovereign will. He closes his will to comprehend further understanding of what he has, which the Lord calls foolish. You talk to people today, and they're talking about the miracles that took place at Azusa Street, they're talking about what the Lord did, they're talking about things that happened when they were young, they have no comprehension of the things that they're going to need to understand in the future because they've closed their minds to progressive revelation knowledge. And what we find here, so what happens? Verse 8, the foolish said to the wise, give us of your oil for our lamps are gone out. You didn't notice it's interesting. He divides the two. He calls the five foolish, five wise. He doesn't say, well, <clears throat> the virgins said to the virgins, no, they're now being identified by their mental state. Mm. These guys are foolish because they willfully put themselves in a disadvantageous situation that this enabled them from being prepared for what was taking place and now they are trying to get the wise to make up for what they themselves didn't do. And the wise aren't going to fall into that trap. What did the wise say? The wise tell them. The wise answered saying, not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. But go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. <clears throat> Basically, this is saying, you have to do what we did. You have to go to the source just as we did. You have to get the revelation knowledge that you missed when we first started. You have to get the comprehension. You got to make up for your own mistakes. We're not going to jeopardize entering into the marriage because of your failure to do what you knew you should have done. Surely the Holy Spirit would be saying that to the foolish, but one presumes that they couldn't hear it anyway. Certainly. Mm. They shut down the Holy Spirit. Mm. Wasn't the Holy Spirit <coughs> they didn't want to give them, it was them that refused to receive. Yeah. Oh, we got enough. We don't know. That's superfluous. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need to know that. That's spiritual, super spiritual. Yeah. We got enough of what we know. We know what's going to take place. And it may have been that some of the wives tried to tell them, hey, look, you know, you need to know that. I don't tell me about that. I, right. you know, you're wasting my time. I'm, you know, I got other things to do. That sounds very funny. <coughs> yes. <coughs> so the time comes when they needed to understand and then turn to the wise and say, what was it you were trying to tell me? Sorry. You got to get it on your own. The Holy Spirit is right there. You got to take time to hear what he has to tell you. And of course, by the time they get through hearing and understanding, it's, it's closed. Verse 10, while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. They that That's were it. Ready. The opportunity is gone. <clears throat> Afterwards came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Now this illustrates a principle. What is the principle that it's illustrating? When you fall behind, I'm going to repeat this, when you fall behind, if you fall behind, you can never make up for the time that was lost. You can get back on track. You can be restored. You can be complimented with what's available to you, but you will never be on the level that you once were. You cannot catch up. Neither could they. Once the opportunity was gone, that's it. That door closed. They will never, never, never make the fullness of sonship. The five wise went in. They got everything that was coming to them. What happened to the five foolish? Verse 12, But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. 
rejection. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So basically what he's saying here, <coughs> to cut off. The Holy Spirit at the time of the rapture separates from this fallen region. The whole fallen region falls into total darkness. Remember, it's the midnight hour. It doesn't get any darker than that. They're here now in the darkness region with everybody else. The difference, though, even though they've been cut off, the Spirit is still in them. He doesn't call them sinners. They're still virgins. Why? Because they still want to get to the bridegroom. They haven't rejected the bridegroom. They just have been foolish in not being totally prepared. So they're going to have to work out their destiny through the tribulation period. <clears throat> the first thing that they will do, <clears throat> they got revelation knowledge. They have a desire to serve the Lord. And that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to become the movers and shakers ahead of all the saints that got left behind. So they'll be the highest level of all those who were left behind. And you said the Holy Spirit is still with them. He's still in them. In them. Okay. He's not with them. So they can get revelation from the Holy Spirit. They have the revelation now because they went and got it. <coughs> Just that they can't go... In the rapture, the doors close, sure. so they're confined to the earth. But they can use that revelation knowledge to inculcate the ones that were left behind that are now going to repent, become martyrs. These become the apostles and the prophets of during the tribulation era, the churches. And you read about them. Revelation, the 18th chapter, verses 19 to 20. We're going to read verses 19 to 24. <clears throat> this gives you a picture of those that repented during the tribulation era and what happens to them. <clears> Haunted <throat> city is destroyed. The merchants, the kings, all are in mourning. They cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, their great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea, by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets. This is the, this is the five virgins. Foolish virgins. You holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. Now this, this speaks quite a lot. <coughs> First of all, it's telling us, it's giving us a picture of what's taking place, tribulation period, and to the end of the first half of the tribulation period, the haunted city has egregiously afflicted the saints on earth. Uh, <clears throat> they've been delivered up, made sport, killed, uh, totally misused and abused, particularly with emphasis on the apostles and the prophets, the leaders of the tribulation era church. They die, they're martyred, they go up to a lower region of heaven. What you have is the voice is coming from the heaven of heavens, speaking to a lower level heavens in which the apostles and prophets are now residing. And that's what it says. <clears throat> Verse 20, Rejoice over her heaven and 
the holy apostles and prophets, basically those that are dwelling in this heaven. For God had avenged you on her. And the mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. The voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft for he shall be, <coughs> he be, shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. <clears throat> so the harlot city is a repository of <clears throat> the martyrs of the first half of the tribulation period. She's wiped out, of course, at the rise of the beast and the ten nations, or the ten kings. At what point do these who have been deposited in the Harlot City go up into the heavens? As they die. In the, in, okay, in their various groups, right. Mm -hmm. And they go up to evidently specific regions, high regions of heavens, but not the highest, not the heaven of heavens. Mm. Because the heaven of heavens is speaking to this lower heaven where the apostles and the prophets are listening to what's being said. Yes. They're going to paradise? Mm-hmm. Yes. How is it only one group go up under the altar and have no clothing? Why are they the only ones who don't have clothing? <coughs> because it depends on the state, your spiritual state at the time you die. Okay. So they had the worst spiritual state. They didn't have time to get robes. They just died uh, being naked. So they didn't have a spiritual state is what I'm understanding you to me. No. What they did was, these are the ones that got caught, suddenly realized what time it was and repented. And get, right after the gospel is preached. Give their testimony and um, basically uh, resign themselves to a martyr's death. They haven't had time to reconstitute their robes. Robes will be reconstituted by the works that you do. The second group that are at the altar to come out of great tribulation says they wash their robes. In other words, they've had time to make robes and get them works. spotless. The first group didn't. This group does. Because the first half of the tribulation period is about a 30 to 40 year period. What I'm getting to is we know that those who make the new heavens, excuse me, the new earth, um, have not had time, I guess, or willingness to create positions for themselves. To, to stop, to yeah, they have there. no positions because they didn't do anything, or the things that they did were not sufficient enough to last eternally. Right. But the ones who didn't have robes, do they have positions? Uh, they, have, so, they have rewards, yes. I was going to say, if so, are they the lowest positions? Mm hmm Okay. Yes. Yes. Are they sons? Yeah. They couldn't go to heaven unless they had the sun spirit in them. But they just made it by the skin of their teeth, qualifying for sonship and positions in heaven. And in that respect, God weighs where you die, why you die, the time that you die, or commensurate what position you're going to have mm -hmm. in the heavens. Mm -hmm. You have some people that are going to die after them to have a higher position. Yes. <clears throat> the ones that come out of uh, the second half of the tribulation period, 666, they're way up there uh, by the throne mm -hmm. on the sea of glass. They die after these guys die. So the intensity of the influence adds to that. Determines. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because the time of the beast is going to be greater evil than the time of the harlot city. Sure.
Now, virgins. What we find? We define a virgin as somebody who has not had sexual intercourse. It also means somebody who has one bridegroom. He's married to one individual that's the Lord Jesus. But they have not consummated the marriage. That's why it's called a virgin. Doesn't mean he becomes a bride member. It means he has a relationship with the Lord. Turn to Revelation 14 verses 1 to 4. It's another group of virgins that come up. They come up higher than these. <clears throat> Revelation 14 verses 1 to 4. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, with him a hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voices of harpers harping with their harps. The ones that are harping with their harps are the elders. And they, the 144,000, sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. The song that they're singing is their testimony. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. These are the first of the nation of Israel. <coughs> they are physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because each one represents a tribe. So what is being said here, this is the only ones that are in heaven that have a Jewish identity, <coughs> which are called first fruits, which is basically prototokos, but not in the sense of <coughs> the prototokos that are eternal and have an eternal calling. This is a prototokos, which is the first fruits of a nation of Israel is being presented to the Lord. These come from the first half of the tribulation period where the two witnesses have so influenced them that they repent and they are sealed. They go through the first half of the tribulation period. Turn to <coughs> Revelation. Just before you turn, please. Yeah. So the term prototokos applied to this specific group in this context only. Yes. Has nothing at all to do with the predestination. No. Okay, so this is after the um, the foundation of the earth. Yes, it's they're they're group. not eternally called. They're temporarily called. Yes. But these are the highest of that group, yes. of that order. All right. Yes. In Revelation seventh chapter Seventh chapter, verse 1 to verse 4. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. He cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them that were sealed, and that were sealed were a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of 
Israel. So this is the same group, but they're on earth at the beginning <clears throat> of the judgments that are going to fall on the earth. And the angel tells the the, the, the four angels that are holding back the four winds, don't release the wind until we have sealed the servants because God is not going to allow his righteous <clears throat> to experience any harm in any judgment that he pours out on the earth. They're going to be supernaturally protected. Now when the creatures are released, these hideous looking beings to come up from the subterranean region and are jumping on people, stinging them, but not killing them. The 144,000 are walking around, not a problem in the world because they have the Father's seal in their foreheads, nor any of the other plagues that's going to fall on these people. These are going to be protected until they're raptured in Revelation the 12th. Uh, Revelation the 14th chapter. You say, why is all that? Because the Father wants a group from Israel in heaven. The nation itself is never going to see heaven. It was never promised heaven. It's going to remain on the new earth. And the promises are given it eternally land on the earth. This group <coughs> The Father selects because He wants the first fruits of the nation of Israel to experience heaven. And that's what happens. And in that respect, they are going to be on a higher plateau than the <coughs> prophets and the apostles that missed the rapture. Different situations for different individuals who overcome different circumstances. It's all going to be taught to the students at the beginning of SARS because this is part of the hidden revelation. Mm -hmm. Everybody that's been called is going to receive revelation knowledge through the wisdom that the Father has bestowed upon them. In other words, the capacity to understand has been given you from eternity. You're going to understand it. You're going to teach it to those that the Father sends to you. I'm going to prepare them for <coughs> the gathering. By the time of the gathering, <coughs> they're going to know all there is to know, or need to know. And then we will be prepared for our phase of ascension at that point to receive our inheritance. The Father has all of this worked out. All we have to do is be yielded to what he wants to do through us. Yes. I have to ask it. Yes. Well, everybody that's called to the gathering, they can. No. No. Everybody's called to be a prototokis. It's not going to make it. This is why we're going through what we're going through. We are qualifying for what we've been called for. In the time of your calling, the Father expects us to totally yield to what He's called us to do. We see the divergence here. This is the cream, cream de la creme, the cream of the crop. Didn't make it. Only half of them made it. Why? Because half of them determined on their own <laughs> that they knew enough to get them to where they needed to go. They didn't need any more help. Well, they pay a heavy price for doing that. <clears throat> the fatal flaw is when a person begins to lean on his own understanding, figure, that he's got it figured out. He can make it from here. He doesn't need anything else. The average Christian thinks they know. They never ask, well, I want to make sure that I know. No, they think they know, so that's good enough for them. Just like the five foolish virgins. Thought they know, they made a decision. I don't need this oil, I'll leave it here till I come back. 
You ask the average Christian, I'm waiting for the rapture. Are you, are you sure that's what you're waiting? Oh, yes. I read the scripture. I know. Well, did you test? No, I don't need to test it. I already got it made. You're too super spiritual. Thank you, but I don't need it. I got it. 